Folks, we want to read today from the Gospel of St. Luke, and we're in chapter 10. Luke's Gospel, chapter 10, and we're going to cut into the chapter in verse 17. Luke's Gospel, chapter 10, verse 17. The word of God simply says this. And the seventy returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through your name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding, in this rejoice, not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and the prudent, and has revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. All things are delivered to me of my Father. And no man knoweth who the Son is but the Father, and who the Father is but the Son, and he to whom the Son will reveal him. And he turned him unto his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see the things That ye see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see those things which you see, and have not seen them, and have seen them not, and to hear those things which you hear, and have not heard them. We finish the reading there, and we just trust as always that the Lord's blessing will be upon his word today for his name's sake and for his glory. We have been looking at what have been called, the series called The New Realm. We thought about that little verse, John 3, verse 3, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And without repeating some of the stuff that I've said over this last week or two, we did say how we fall short on that verse. Because we have reduced that verse quite simply into the fact that a person needs to be saved in order to go to heaven. But that is not what the verse says, although that truth is certainly very, very 100% true. Except the man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom. And we've been highlighting this last week or two, that new realm in which the Lord has brought you and me into if we are born again of his spirit, washed in his precious blood. And we've been thinking about the new birth. And in particular, this new realm uh, that, that, that it's opened up to us. And I thought the first week is, what, what, was, what is the kingdom? Last week I thought about, where is the kingdom? And I want for a time today to settle our thoughts upon the whole idea of walking in the kingdom. Because, beloved, this is a place where we are called to. This is a place where we are to engage life. This is a place where we are to live life. We are not to live life on the natural realm. We are spiritual beings. We have been quickened. You who were dead in sins, hath he quickened. And thank God today we have been made alive spiritually to experience a spiritual realm and to walk and engage with that realm in which we find ourselves. We have sold, as I've said, the new birth. Sold it short for what it really is. Because so many people, as I've said before, they get saved and they just sit around waiting for something that's going to happen whenever they die. But as I mentioned last Sunday morning, I said that, you know, we are not born again simply to to get to heaven. We need that, of course. And there is no other way into heaven. We don't, you know, we don't make any, any qualms about that whatsoever. But friends, we are saved so that God can live in us Today, amen. That he can live in us today. We are saved so that God can be seen through us today. We are saved so that God can work through us today. 
And instead of waiting for something to happen which is up ahead, we need to be pressing into the new realm. We need to be pressing into the kingdom of God today. Because now is the accepted time. You and I aren't sure of tomorrow. You and I don't know what's going to happen next week or next month. We are so good at preaching that to the unsee of people and telling those people, now's the time to put their faith and their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. But we are so slow to talk about that amongst ourselves, the people of God. And we don't know what's up ahead. We don't know how long we have. Isn't that right? And you know that old hymn, Only One Life. It will soon be past. Only what's done for Jesus will last. And I ask today, I ask you as I look at my own life, what am I, what are you, what are we doing for Jesus in his kingdom in these days of time? You see, friends, today, being saved means that I am looking at something that can be mine. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6, Jesus said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things shall be added unto you. And again, that's a text that we will take so often in our evangelism, and we'll tell people that they need to be putting Jesus first in their lives, they need to be getting saved, and anything else in life that's necessary or needed, Jesus will add that. But what about believers today? You see, it's possible for you to be living today saved by the grace of God, washed in the precious blood of Jesus, born again of the Spirit of God, but you are not seeking first the kingdom, as he has told you and me to do. And those are his words. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added unto you. What do you see when you see the kingdom? That's the big question for us all. If Jesus said, except you are born again, you cannot see it. And if Jesus says then that we are to seek that kingdom, the question that comes on the back of that quite naturally then is, what is a person supposed to seek? You see, he seeks for Jesus. He seeks for Jesus to be Lord in the life. That's the working of sanctification. That's the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. He doesn't give us the Holy Spirit in order that we can sit back on an armchair somewhere and relax until the great day when he calls us to be with him. Thank God for the truth of that. But friends, he gives us the Holy Spirit to live for him here and now. To as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. What did the Son of God do when he walked this scene of time? Well, you read that in your Gospels. You read that in your Acts of the Apostles. And we see what the Son of God wants to do. And he gives you and he gives me power to experience and to engage that same realm of the Spirit that he engaged and that he walked in. And so the person needs to seek for Jesus to be his Lord, for the Holy Spirit to be in control of his life, to be tamed, to be tamed. Meekness is a great word, one of the fruit of the Spirit. And it means power and it means authority that has been brought under control. It means power that has been, been harnessed. It means tamed in the Bible, as far as the Bible is concerned. Can I ask you today, has he tamed your spirit? Has he tamed your soul? Has he tamed your life? To be tamed in the Bible sense, it doesn't mean being what we think it means today. It doesn't mean making some little spineless something out of somebody. That's not what meekness is. And yet so often we feel that's exactly what it is. But the Bible says Moses was the meekest man on the face of the earth. Take a look at the life of Moses sometime. Was Moses a weakling? Was Moses spineless? And yet, beloved, let's be honest about it. We live in days when so many in the church is exactly that. Weak, spineless. 
But we can't fit Moses. We can't fit the heroes of faith that we see over in the book of Hebrews. We can't fit those people into that kind of mold. No, there were people who were submitted. There were people who were surrendered to God. But there were people, praise God, the Bible says, who did exploits. Hallelujah. Because that's the power of the Spirit within the life. Power, meekness is power that's harnessed, surrendered to the ministry of the Holy Spirit under control. And that's the kingdom of God. You and me, for you and me to be tamed, to be tamed by God. You're sitting very quiet today. So we are. To be tamed by God, under the control of God. Can I ask you, are you? Are you? In your individual, in your personal life, are you under the control of Almighty God? You see, friends, that's the secret of the kingdom. The secret of the kingdom. If you want to walk in the kingdom, that's where the power comes from. Being under the control of God in the kingdom. And it's there, you see, praise God, that things become possible. It's there that this kingdom, praise God, becomes a reality now. It's there that we can have authority and power over the enemy, and we can have it now. You see, we've said it before. This poor, sick world sadly needs to see a kingdom witness. And if truth be told, the church is anything but that in the nation in which we live. We are classed, we are regarded for the main part as a group of people who come together for some reason on a Sunday morning and we are completely irrelevant as far as the nation is concerned. Whenever the church expresses a voice in any particular thing, there are so many factions of the church and so much disagreement and debate in it that the voice of the church is completely powerless to speak into the nation in which we find ourselves today. We are sitting, for instance, in a Brexit situation today, filled with confusion. Where does confusion come from? It comes from the enemy. And it's because the church has not been there to speak with the right kind of voice that will steer and guide this nation the way God wants this nation to go. But God is sovereign. We'll touch this in a minute or two. God will have his way. And it's up to you and me to engage the kingdom, to pray about that in the kingdom, to bring that before the throne of grace in the kingdom and see to it that God's name is honored and uplifted and glorified. And we live in a world that sees, needs to see the kingdom witness. We live in a world of sick people. Did you ever see as much sickness, did you? Seriously. As we see in these days of time. You know, we come week after week to the prayer meeting. We have a list of people so long on the, in the prayer meeting that we don't give out all their names anymore. They're just so numerous. And every week, somebody else is added to it. Every week, a new situation in some family has arisen. Every week, somebody else gets touched by cancer. And we're living in a sick society at a time whenever sickness is on the rise. There is so much sickness. How we need to see people made well. Amen. Oh, come on. Say it as if you mean it. Don't we need to see people made well? Now, understand me for one moment. I'm not saying for one minute that everybody won't be sick. You know, there's great mysteries in God, and we know that. And one person can be blessed and healed miraculously, and another person doesn't be. And God says that he'll be with us through the water, he'll be with us through the fire. And other people, he delivers them out of the water, and he delivers them out of the fire. I'm not foolish enough or naive enough to say that everybody will be healed and everybody will be well. But friends, we should be seeing more nonetheless. Amen. That's where I'm coming from here. That's where I'm coming from. But we need to see people well all over. Not just physically, but also spiritually. How we need to see people brought into line with a sound mind. Because we live in a world that is being tormented by sin, tormented by the enemy and tormented by his emissaries. Of course, a lot of the church today doesn't believe there is such a thing as that. 
But nonetheless, that's what's there. Jesus says here in Luke chapter 10, he says, I give you power. Verse 19, I give you power over that. I give you power over that. He says, I give you power to tread on serpents. I give you power to tread on, on scorpions. The serpents and the scorpions that he's speaking about there is the enemy, the devil, the demonic hordes. That's what Jesus is speaking about there. And in this chapter of Luke's gospel, in these verses you read about, you will find there's a threefold joy in these verses that are before us this morning. You see, verses, let me read them again. Verse 17, And the seventy returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Do you know this morning there's joy in service? They have just been out serving him. They have just been out doing what he had sent them out to do. And it says they come back in verse 17. They return again with joy. Thank God today there is joy in serving Jesus. Amen. And we sing that. Joy in serving Jesus as I journey on my way. Joy that fills the heart with glory every hour and every day. There is joy, joy, joy in serving Jesus. And we see that joy here in these verses. We see not just that joy, but we see there's also joy not just in service, but there's joy in salvation. Let me read verse 20 to you. Notwithstanding in this rejoice not, that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written down in heaven. There's joy in salvation. Tell your face that right now, will you? Praise God, there's joy in salvation. Are you glad you're saved today? Eh, we should be the happiest people on earth. Thank God today, we're in relationship with our heavenly Father. We're in relationship with the one who gives us our next breath. We're in relationship, listen, redeemed with his precious blood, not by works of righteousness that we have done, but because he loves us, he has saved us, he gave his life, and he has called us to us. Come on, where's the joy? We should be rejoiced, thank you. We should be rejoicing in that. I watch you sometimes. Do you know I'm going to tell you, you can chat to one another and you can laugh and smile all the time. You see, never comes to anything to do with this. This is what happens. It's as if we're afraid to enjoy the things of God. You see, the kingdom of God, look, you and I, we are brought into this new realm. And the Bible tells us in the book of Galatians, whenever it speaks about what the Holy Spirit does and what the Holy Spirit brings into the life. In Galatians chapter 5, whenever you come into the fruit of the Spirit, love, we experience love. Aren't you glad he loves you today? Praise God for that love. We've gathered around his table. Thank God for the love of Jesus portrayed, demonstrated at the cross. Love. You know the next fruit? They're all one fruit. But you know the next part? Joy. And God's people are this. You know, if our faces could get any longer, they would. And yet joy is a part of this kingdom. Joy is a part of this realm. And Jesus says to them here, you know, you're happy, you are come back in joy, you've been serving, you've seen things happen there. That's just glorious. But he says, don't rejoice so much in that. He says, rejoice that your names are written down in heaven. Praise God, heaven knows my name. Hallelujah. Heaven knows your name if you're saved today. In fact, the Bible says your name's engraved upon the palms of his hands. Isn't that tremendous? The Bible tells us that he, he brings your name before the Father's throne. He ever lives to make intercession for us. Joy of our salvation. Then the third joy that we see in these verses is the joy of sovereignty. Let me read verse 21 to you. 
In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. All things are delivered to me of the Father, and no man knoweth who the Son is but the Father, and who the Father is but the Son, and he to whom the Son will reveal him. And he turned them on to his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see the things that you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see those things which you see and have not seen them. And to hear those things which you hear and have not heard them. Do you realize how privileged we are today, beloved? First of all, we are privileged in the fact that we live at a time in the history of this world when we do live. Because we live in what's known as the last days. When God has promised, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. And thank God today, you and I, if we are saved, we have received the Holy Spirit. He dwells within us. He's an abiding presence in our lives. The Old Testament saints never knew anything of that. Prophets would prophesy, things were done, the Holy Spirit would come upon a man, the Holy Spirit would leave him again. But you and I have this privilege that he doesn't come upon us, but praise God, he dwells within us, amen. That's a source of joy on its own. Oh, still he comes upon us, yes, but he never leaves us. He never forsakes us. He dwells within us all of the time. What a privilege that is. But here, what about this privilege? The privilege that today you're sitting in this congregation, saved by the grace of God, and thousands in this surrounding district aren't. Is that not a privilege? And you and I can't manage a smile, and we can't manage joy in the house of God. She beloved, we take all of these things so much for granted. So much for granted. And somehow... People look at us and they sort of, forgive me for using the old cliche, cliche, so sometimes people look at us and all we're doing as far as they're concerned is we're enduring this thing called salvation whenever we're meant to enjoy it. I don't know about you, I enjoy my salvation, do you? I enjoy it. I just love being in relationship with Jesus, not as close with Jesus as what I could be and should be, but God knows my heart on that. But I just love it, folks. I just love it. What a it is to be one of his. The 70 have returned to report their victories to the Lord Jesus Christ. Can I ask you, what victories have you had in your experience and in your life this past week? See, they come back here to report these victories. They've had power to heal given to them by Jesus. Isn't that right? Well, let me ask you this question. Isn't that what we have? Isn't it? They had power and authority not just to heal diseases, to heal the sick, but they had power and authority have given you power to tread in serpents and scorpions. They had power to deal with demons. Isn't that what we have? You're not sure about that one either. They had power and authority also to preach the word of God. Isn't that what we have? You see, you can turn to Mark's Gospel, chapter 16. And Jesus gives the commission. And Jesus says, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believes not shall be damned. And then here's the Pentecostal bit that we all love so much. These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. 
And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Oh, wait a minute, Pastor. Wait a minute. Denver, do you not know that those verses are added in at the end of Luke, or of Mark's Gospel, chapter 16? Do you not know, Denver, that those maybe weren't in the original manuscript? Can I say something to anybody who thinks that this morning? Let me say this to you lovingly. Those verses were added to Mark's Gospel, chapter 16, long before Elam ever existed. And if I can't take this word of God and proclaim it in its entirety, and if I can't take this word of God and believe it from cover to cover, then it's time to dump it in the bin and forget all about it. But you see, folks, for some reason, we would far rather put these things, these signs of the kingdom, these spiritual things, some of these things upset us. Some of these things, we can't explain them. We can't understand them. Some of these things we are afraid of. And it's so much easier to put them behind us and forget about them than to engage with Christ and somehow get into them in the kingdom of God the way he's told us to. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. They shall take up service. I know there's churches, there's denominations and they practice that kind of thing. And to me, that's just downright stupidity. Because it's a spiritual thing that's been talked about. We are power over the enemy. Do you believe that today? Yeah. <clears throat> no. They'll cast out demons in my name. And you see, here's the thing. Whenever you take that and you bring it all back into what happened to the 70 here in, in Luke chapter 10, long before ever Jesus spoke those words in Mark chapter 16, whenever you come back to what the 70 have just seen in Luke chapter 10, everything they did, they said, was by his name. By his name. Verse 17. Because it says there, And the seventy returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject to us through thy name. Through thy name. Through thy name. Part to heal. Part to deal with the demonic. Part to preach this gospel of the kingdom, bless God. Power and authority in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And friends, he has given that to us too. You know, I find it interesting in the Gospels. There are people today who will say, oh, those are apostolic gifts. And I find it amazing in the Gospels because on one occasion Jesus sends the 12 apostles out. And on another occasion he sends out 70. They weren't all apostles. And I take us back again to what Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. And they're all looking at them speaking in tongues and the Holy Spirit is coming and they think they're drunk. And we, we touched a wee bit on that last Sunday morning. And then Peter says, no, no. He says, the Holy Spirit, in the last days, I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. He says, what you're seeing here is the fulfillment of the prophet Joel. The Spirit of God has been poured out upon these lives. And then he says, this promise is unto you and to your children. That's the generation. Because they're going to hear this gospel. To those that are afar off, that's the geography. Even as many as the Lord our God shall call, that's the timeline. And if you and I are called today, the same promises for you. The same abilities are for you. The same authority is for you. The same dealing with the works of the enemy is for you and for me. Because that's the realm that he has brought us into. And that's the blessing that he has bestowed upon his people. And don't let anybody ever try to tell you those things are finished. And I know, forgive me for saying this, but I'm going to say it. And I'm treading fearlessly here. Some of you, whenever they happen in this church, you don't like it. And I know that. I see how some of you react whenever they're manifest in the church. Be very careful what you do with the Holy Spirit. And I mean that. Because these things aren't done away with. These things are part and parcel. In a world that's sick, in a world where the occult and demonic activity is rising, do we not need these gifts today just the same as the early church needed them? Do we not? It would be a fool, a fool who would birth a church in power at Pentecost and talk in his word about what the last days would be like 
and the, the, the demonism of the last days and, and, and the danger, perilous times, all of those things that are spoken in the Word. Would it not be a fool that would birth a church in power and then leave a church powerless to deal with the end time? But you see, we would rather stay away from these things because I've said we can't explain them. And some of them we're uncertain about. And you know another problem, folks, and forgive me for saying this as well, we would far rather read somebody's commentary than read and believe what it says in the Word of God. Whenever I first came, we're here eight years, we're just into our ninth year. Whenever I first came to this assembly, there were folk at that time, and if the gifts of the Spirit operated here, I had to go out to their house because of what had happened in the meeting. And I found myself out there on a number of occasions trying to defend what the Scripture says about the Holy Spirit, about His relevance today, about His power today, about His presence today in the life of the believer, about what He has given to the church that's still here today. And I found myself out there on a number of occasions in that home defending what the Scripture said about the Spirit. Do you know why they defended what they said? A certain commentator says, and it was always the same commentator. Now you tell me what's right. Is it the views of some person? Or is it the word of God? And you see, that's where we live at today. It's the Trojan horse. We'll be speaking on that in a week or two's time. It's the Trojan horse that has come into the church. And we're filled with unbelief. And we suck in everything that somebody has written because it seems to be good or because they have a big congregation or because they have a big church or because they're well respected. And listen, forgive me, I am not trying to put anyone down by saying that. But beloved, listen. That's our touchstone for all things. Not some book that somebody has written. And it's time that we got back to that book. Time we started to do what God has called us and God has, has chosen us to do. And as we do that, there's joy in serving him. As we do that, there's joy in salvation. And there's also joy in his sovereignty. Bless his holy name. But you see, we have become content. They had power over sickness. They had power over demons. They had power to preach the word. We have become content just to be people who preach the word. And the Holy Spirit, he is something who may be there or may not be there, but we're not really sure because we never really see any evidence of him. And we're told anyway that he's come to live in our lives and we take the word and we say, well, that's what the Bible says, that must be right. But we never really experience any evidence of him. And we don't know where we stand. But I thank God this morning there's a kingdom that I see. There's a kingdom that I can feel. There's a kingdom that I can engage in, that I can be a part of. And Jesus says, all believers are in that kingdom and we have power and we have authority in his name. Bless his holy name. Bless his holy name. Individual victories. And you know, sometimes... Sometimes we will experience individual victories in life and we think they're, they're not really important. But folks, they are important. Because that victory in your life that may seem small is part of the bigger picture. And Jesus sees that small victory in your life as part of the ongoing battle against the enemy in the spiritual kingdom that we live in. Part of what he is doing, praise God. And as believers, we are weak in ourselves. But praise God, we can be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Amen. Because the book of Ephesians says that. And we're to put on the whole armor of God. Ephesians 6 and verse 10. But each victory is important to the Lord. No matter how insignificant it may seem to be in our eyes. And Satan, of course, he will not finally be judged, of course not, until Jesus casts him into the lake of fire, as Revelation chapter 20 speaks about. But God's people can claim Christ's Calvary victory by faith. Praise God today. Hallelujah. 
Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. The enemy, of course, will not give up without a fight. Isn't that right? Hey, the enemy would be inclined to say, bring it on. And he attacks God's saints, he attacks God's servants and people, seeking to destroy, seeking to tear down, seeking to, to cause havoc amongst what God wants to do. And that's why the Lord Jesus added the words of verse 19 here. Because he assured them that their authority was not gone, even in the midst of whenever things go wrong. Just because the preaching trip had ended for these people, they could continue, and they could continue in the authority of the Lord, to tread on serpents and so on. You see, their names and ours, he says here, are written down in heaven. And that's the important thing. Let me tell you a wee thing about that word written for just a moment or two, and then we'll, we'll wind it up. What he does in that verse, rejoice rather that your names are written down in heaven. He gives them an assurance in that verse, an assurance. And the Greek word there, written, means to inscribe. And, and it's used in, in the context or in the thought of to inscribe formally or to inscribe solemnly, if you want to put it that way. And it was a Greek word that was used for the signing of a will. It was a, an authoritative thing. Or it could have been used on a marriage document. Okay, there'll be a marriage coming up shortly. <laughs> and it's good to have the young couple in with us this morning. But it was, it was used, you know, on a marriage document, document. The word written was used whenever, for instance, they signed a, a peace treaty. And it was also used for enrolling of, of a citizen. And the perfect tense in the Greek means it stands written. Get that. It stands written. It's not just something that's written down that's going to disappear again. But it's authoritative. Thank God it stands written. And friends, the new realm is a higher kingdom. And that's where our citizenship is. That's where you and I have been brought into. But again, let me say, we are content to dwell on the lower plane, on the lower level, in the lower realm of the natural. When, when Chairman Mao, do you remember him, China? When Chairman Mao took over China in 1949, they estimate that there was about one million Protestants Believers, I suppose. But one million Protestants in China at that time. And he came to power, it was 1949, and listen, he slaughtered them, he plundered them, he scattered them. And in 1976, whenever he eventually died, it was estimated that there were at least 50 million born-again believers in China. And the number varies depending what statistics you read. Anything from 50 million to 100 million born-again believers in China. Listen, without a structured church, without the freedom to testify, without the freedom to have open church, and that simply means, whenever I say open church and testify, that simply means that they had to win people one on one. You see, you couldn't invite a person into the house where you were gathering to worship if they weren't saved because they would tell the authorities and the authorities would come and do their worst with you. But they won them one by one, face to face. And from 1949 down to 1976, there's some difference between a million. And let's be very conservative. Let's say 50 million. There's some difference between 1 million and 50. I, I, in, my, in my mathematical days, that's a 50-fold increase, isn't it? Huh? 50-fold increase. And you see, what actually happened in the country at that time was Chairman Mao came to power, and, and, and they had such 
great expectations for China at that time. He made them great promises at that chi- time. But you see, the problem was it all, it all fell apart. And there was a, a vacuum that had been created in the nation. And there was nothing really for people to look to and nothing really for people to believe in. And they would see a man on the street with a spring in his step, with a smile on his face, with a song in his heart. And people would go up to a man like that and say to him, what are you drinking? What are you smoking? What are you high on? That you seem to be in in such a, a state of elation. And the man would simply say, I found Jesus. And you see, what he had, they wanted too. Beloved, haven't we lost our way? Haven't we? The majority of people look at you and look at me. And I include myself in this. The majority of people look at you and they look at me. And they want to stay a million miles away from us. But there was a nation. And whenever they saw people who had been transformed like that, they were just so inquisitive about what had taken place that they were surrendering to the claims of Jesus Christ. And you see, that's the difference. That's the sovereignty part of the joy that's in these verses. You see, I've told you before, Reinhard Bunke said where he grew up at, whenever the tide was out, huge barges sat and the barges were down sitting on the muck in the bottom of the water. Whenever the tide came in, He said you couldn't have moved them. But whenever the tide came in and the barges were floating, he said you could have put your foot to them and just give them a push like that and the huge barges went out across the water. You see, that's the sovereignty of God. And whenever you and whenever I engage the kingdom and whenever you and whenever I surrender to the authority of the kingdom and whenever you and whenever I take our lives and place them in meekness before the spirit of the kingdom, the Holy Spirit, It's then that the sovereignty of God can kick into play. And instead of you and I trying to do this and trying to do that and trying to win that soul and trying to see that soul touched and trying to see that life out, instead of you and I trying to do that, we play catch up with the Holy Spirit and he leads us to the opportunities that he's making and creating. And the work of God becomes easy. I told you before, I went in one night, Korean Hospital. It was late at night. Lady had... She had had a hysterectomy, and a couple or three weeks later, she was so ill, they took her in. She had septicemia. She was in the intensive care, and Greta and I went down that night. It was probably 11 o'clock or later. Went into the ward. Knocked the door. The nurse let me in. Greta waited in the corridor outside. She was praying outside, and I went in, stood beside the bed. Never forget it. There were pipes connected to everything. And I mean that. And thank God for the medical profession. She was wired up to everything. And she was completely gone out of it. She was unconscious. Didn't even know it was there. And I stood for a moment at the side of the bed. It's heartbreaking, you know. Whenever you see that heartbreaking. And her mother, a member of our church, praying continuously for her. And I stood for a moment and looked at her at the side of the bed and I thought, this is bad. And I laid my hand on her head. And I just prayed quietly. You know, you're in intensive care. The last thing you want to do is be a nuisance or anything like that. I laid my hand on her head and I prayed quietly for her. And after I finished, I walked away from the bed, slipped out through the door of the ward and Greta and I were making our way down the corridor. And the next thing we hear a voice behind us and we turn and the nurse from the ward had come out and she says to me, you're a minister, aren't you? I says, I am. She says, when you come in, she says, you were in praying for somebody at a bed there. She says, there's a lady in a bed, two beds up, wants you to come and pray for her too. And I went back in 
up to this older lady. I didn't know who she was. She's from the wee Bally Castle direction. And she was lying in there with a liver problem. And she said to me, I heard you praying. And I was not loud. Understand me, I wasn't loud. And she says to me, I heard you praying. She says, will you pray for me? And I said to her, certainly, no problem. But I said, do you know the Lord? And she says, how do you mean? She says, do you know Jesus Christ? I said, he died on the cross for you. Is he your personal savior? She says, no, he's not. She says, I have you ever thought about that? She says, I'd love to be saved. Yeah, and I led her to the Lord in the bed, in the intensive care. And I prayed for her. And I visited her a week later out in the ordinary ward and I bought her a Bible. And I don't know where she is today. But you see, what I'm trying to say is, whenever you engage the kingdom, you walk with the Holy Spirit. He lives within us. He leads again. You see, Jesus sent these out to do a work of mission. And all they had to do was follow the Spirit of Almighty God, the Spirit whom we try to rebuke and get behind us all the time. And all they had to do was follow the Spirit of God. And as they followed him, the situations developed that he wanted to touch. You see, if God heals somebody, let me say this to you, it's not because I have done anything, or you either. If God heals somebody, it's because God wanted to do it. In thy name we did these things, Lord. But you and I have the privilege of partnering with him in that, to be the channel or to be the vessel, if you like, that he moves through in order to touch that life with blessing. But you see, we would rather dismiss all of that stuff. Come to church, listen to a sermon preached, go away. If I feel like it, come to a prayer meeting. If I don't, what odds this week? Come back to church next Sunday, do the same thing again. And we live on a natural level instead of engaging the realm in which he has lifted us into. And friends, our time is gone. But may that challenge us today. May that challenge us. I don't know about you, but I am sick and tired. Some of the men talk about being sick and tired of being sick and tired. I'm not coined that phrase. But I'm telling you now, I'm sick and tired of the natural realm in God's work and the spiritual realm being completely evaded by God's people whenever it's the spiritual realm that we really need to touch absolutely everything. You see, Jesus said, without me, not me, him. He says, without me, you can do nothing. But somehow we feel that we can do the studying, that we can put the plans together, that we can organize whatever needs to be organized, and that we can get the job done. And really and truthfully, folks, truth be told, we're doing absolutely nothing. Am I right in that? Lord, help us. Help us to get it right. Help us to submit. Help us to surrender. Their time is gone, and God willing, we'll pick up on it the next time. Father, we just praise you and we thank you today that you are God. Lord, you've determined the end from before the beginning. Lord, don't ever allow us to think for one moment, Lord, that we do anything. But Lord, we thank you there's joy in serving. We thank you there's joy in our salvation. And Lord, we thank you there can be great joy in the sovereignty of God because we can see things happen as we walk in the kingdom, being led, being filled by God, the Holy Spirit. So bless your word to our lives, Lord God, we pray. Bless everyone who's bowed before you. We commit your word and your people to you. In Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Praise God.